Tiger fans, what's going on guys? So this is my second attempt at making this video as the first one failed miserably. I get a mic for this channel so my videos sound better and the mic decides to fall over three quarters of the way through the video. So I'll just go fuck myself. Uh, I wanna apologize for the lateness of this video. I know the Tigers are about to begin here shortly. Uh, as you can see, I look stupider than normal with these glasses because my better half's birthday was this past weekend and we went to a water park and I jumped off of a 15 foot thing. And when you're a man as big as I am and you hit the water, uh, your glasses have a little bit of, uh, you know, force. And so now I have to wear these things because it's the only glasses I have for the time being. So I apologize for your viewing experience for me looking dumber than normal. <coughs> Excuse me. And I apologize for this video being late. So, last time we spoke, the Tigers had just gotten done with a series in Seattle. And they were going into Kansas City where they were going to play a four-game set. And the Tigers took the series from Seattle, making a little bit of ground. And I think the Tigers have, like, the third best record in the Ameri in the MLB uh, over the last 30 games. A lot of that coincides with, uh, you know, the fact having Riley Green back helps a lot. And the fact that, the uh, you know, Spencer torkelson has been hitting and everything else. So, so they go into KC... And they needed to take this series because Minnesota's starting to play better. The Tigers are starting to fall back in the division. They're seven games behind. They need to start making up ground. And everyone who was like, oh, well, Kansas City and Detroit, the KC might be a little bit further ahead in their rebuild uh, than Detroit actually is. And so the Tigers might be in last place. And I called bullshit from that from the beginning because Kansas City sucks. They don't have any pitching. You know, their they're big prospects like Bobby Witt is like their only big prospect and Vinny Pasquantino. You know, they end up getting rid of Ryan Dozier and all this other stuff. Anyways, so they go into KC and they needed to absolutely take the series from them because it's pivotal. You know, they're starting to fall back in the standings. So they go in, first game of the series, they went 3-2. to two. Second game of the series was an absolutely insane game. You want to talk about an absolute slugfest. The Tigers are getting absolutely shit-wrecked in this game. They're down. This is Tarek Skubal's worst start of the season so far. They're down... And Spencer Torkelson in this game just goes off as two home runs, a double. Uh, one was a three-run shot. I think the other one, I think he had maybe two three-run shots or a three-run shot and a two-run shot. I can't remember. It's a little bit uh, sh scratchy in my head now that it's been a few days on it. So he gets in the ninth inning, Scott Barlow comes out, and the Tigers are trailing by five. They ended up getting the tying run to third base with two outs. And they couldn't get the job done. Ended up losing 10 to 11. But you want to talk about an absolute crazy knockout, drag out game. And even though they lost this game, I think this game really goes to show you that this Tigers offense, even though it's not the greatest, there is some pop in this lineup. And this team is capable of hitting some home runs. And this team, this team is more capable than last year's team of putting up a crooked number. Uh you just look down, up and down the lineup. It's it's just a, a lot better than it was last year, even though the the results don't show. And it's kind of sad, you know. You look you look at this team. They didn't have that zero and nine start to the month of June with how they've been playing their last thirty thirty five games. There's no reason why they couldn't be in first place right now, and it just hurts to hurts to to look at the record and look where they're at in the standings because they were one game under five hundred when Riley Green and Erod went out. You have, uh, a th I think they're 19 and 15 uh, over that, that time span. You take off those nine losses and you even just go f 500, one game over 500. I mean, the Tigers are floating probably three, four games over 500 right now, which isn't amazing. But in the AL Central, I mean, that's more than enough to be competing for the division lead and being in first place with as weak and mediocre as this division is. So it kind of sucks to see, you know, how they've been playing uh, but really haven't made up a lot of ground because of, you know, that 0-9 stretch. But the offense, as inconsistent as it's been, it's still much better than last year, and the lineup is a lot better than last year. So then they go out the next couple games, 3-2, shut them out the last game of the series, 3 nothing. The Tigers pitching has been really good. Lorenzen had an absolutely outstanding start his last time out. Erod looked good his last time out. So the Tigers pitching has come in clutch. So you look at overall at their road trip, they go 5-2. and two. They beat two of, of Seattle's best starters. They go into Kansas City, take take three or four, do what they need to do. And then they're going to come home and they're going to face a tough Padres team that is also under 500, but are trying to fight for a wild card spot. 
the West is looking like it's not going to be a possibility, even though the NL West isn't as strong as it's been. But it's a, it's a test for the Tigers. You know, they go and beat a Seattle team that's been extremely average, and they go and take three or four from a Kansas City team that is dog shit. Well, you come into game one at Comerica Park, and the Tigers are down early. Riley Green ends up smacking a two-run shot, and it's four to five going into the ninth inning. And I knew it was over as soon as, as Josh Hader came out. Hader's been absolutely money in the ninth this year. Uh, <laughs> AJ Hinch pinch, hit, pinch hits for Miguel Cabrera. And it's like, what a pinch hit. You got a guy that can't hit fastballs anymore against a guy that's got one of the nastiest sliders and throws 100. Good luck, Miggy. Maybe if this was like Miggy 2013, 2014, you know, he had a chance. Because I can remember that game uh, the Tigers were playing in Cleveland and Danny Salazar had struck out Miguel Cabrera three times. And he was facing him, I think, in the eighth or seventh inning. And he hits a home run to dead center field and he actually points up. Because Danny Salazar could bring it back in the day. That was a guy that threw upper 90s. And, uh, you know, maybe then Miggy had a chance, but they absolutely didn't have a chance. And the Tigers lose this game 4-5. to five. So you're thinking, oh, well, you know, played a tough game. Padres are a team that's been playing better in the month of July. Their offense is really perked up. And, you know, they'll get them tomorrow. Have a chance to take the series, the last game of the series. Yeah, no, the Tigers got shit-wrecked. I mean, absolutely shit-wrecked. They lose 14-3, to and if you wouldn't believe it, the Tigers actually had a lead in this game. They had a 3 nothing lead at one point. Uh, Mason, Eng Mason Engler comes out, gets absolutely shelled, absolutely rocked. He's actually on the IL now. Uh, I forget what for. It's it's got to be something they're giving him some kind of like a fatigue injury or whatnot. I didn't I don't remember what the report said, but after he got knocked around like he got knocked around, uh, not surprising that uh, you know he gets he gets sent out on an IL stint because he got, gave up so many damn runs and the Tigers need to clear a roster spot and he's a Rule Five pick so they can't option him to the minors uh, because he's got to be on the major league roster all year. So Brendan White comes back up. Uh, I think Alex Lowe uh, comes back up uh, from AAA. So the Tigers absolutely get, get shit-wrecked. And uh, it's hard to believe they had a, a lead in this game at one point in time. Manny Machado hits a bomb off of him. It, it just wasn't a pretty game. But they managed to take the series on Sunday. I only got to watch uh, bits and pieces of this game. And uh, Alex Fiedo made a spot start. He, he came up because they wanted to push Tarek School back a day. And Fiedo looked great. This was the best the sliders looked this year. This is the best his fastball commanders looked this year. It was only first spot start. They already optioned him back down to Toledo. But everyone that wants to write Alex Fiedo off, this start shows you why you can't write him off yet. Because when his slider is good and when his fastball is good, this is a guy that has middle to back of the rotation stuff. Now, I understand where he was drafted, and I understand where he should be based off of where he was drafted and, and what he was looked at upon out, out of college. But, you know, you look at his first seven starts in the big leagues, looks great. And then he kind of got his teeth kicked in after that, and then he got hurt with that hip injury. He came back, had a bunch of starts, mixed results, issues with the home run ball, issues with his command. When his slide, the one thing that he's needed, and I've said this multiple times, is he needs a better third pitch because right now he's very fastball slider heavy, and he's not good at getting left-handed hitters out consistently. I think he's very much like a Max Scherzer type. Not that I'm saying he's going to be a Hall of Fame pitcher and, and win three Cy Youngs, more so that Max Scherzer suffered the same issues where he couldn't get out left-handers consistently, and then he developed a third pitch, which was his changeup to go along with a curveball. And, uh, you know, it really unlocked a lot of things for him and he became the pitcher that he was. I think if Fiedo can really develop a plus-plus third pitch or even a, a above-average third pitch, it would really help teams get off of his slider. It would really help his issues against lefties and, you know, maybe help limit the home runs against him as well. So he looked good, though, and it was good to see. He's already optioned back down. It's good to see that the Tigers – finally have that some kind of pitching depth to where they can do shit like that, where they can option Tarek Skubal down, or they can option a starter up and back down again when they want to give someone uh, an extra day's worth of rest in Tarek Skubal. So 
it's not like it was where AJ Hinch is out there like in Texas trying to get through all these multiple bullpen days and there's two bullpen days a week and it was like like fucking pulling teeth trying to get through some of these games because they just were so depleted starter wise and now that everyone's back and they have actually have some health in the rotation you know it's been been great so then they played a makeup game with the San Francisco Giants Tarek Skubal comes out pitches five really good innings nine strikeouts Ended up getting his first win back. And uh, so, didn't make too much ground up in it because, you know, they take two. Uh, they get two two losses from the Padres, only take one. But then they end up getting that game back from San Francisco. So, they're even on the homestand right now, not making up any ground uh, in, the, in the divisional standings-wise where they need to make up ground. And now they welcome in the Angels. Now, the Angels, again, are Mike Troutless coming into Comerica Park because he's got that uh, injury in his hand. But Shohei Otani is having an Aaron Judge-like home run season this year. He's even more dangerous this year than he was last year. This is a team that has been playing a lot better as of late after when they lost Mike Trout, they were over 500, and then they went on a losing streak, fell under 500, and then went and swept the Yankees, and now they've come back, and they've I think they've won five of their last six. And Shohei has pretty much been, been carrying that team. This is a absolute massive series for the Angels because this is the Artie Moreno doesn't want to trade Shohei Otani even though I think they should trade Shohei Otani because he's not coming back to Anaheim and they should rebuild that team and actually give Trout a core uh, of players behind him instead of just one generational talent and him it's not the NBA where you can win with two or five guys you need you know at least five guys on your roster or at least four in your lineup that can hit and some guys that are you know you can swap in and out. But the Angels are they're they're playing to keep Shohei. And they've been playing better as of late. And Shohei has been absolutely unbelievable all year. It's gonna be a treat to watch him for these next three games. I wouldn't be surprised if he homers two or three times over this next upcoming series. Uh He's not pitching, which kind of stinks. I I uh, wanna see Riley Green hit another home run off of him. That'd be awesome. But you're looking at that Angels lineup, it's not that great, you know. I don't think Zach Nato's back. Uh, it's basically been Shohei, Hunter Renfro's in there. Uh, that's that's really about it. They really haven't had much. Jared Walsh, uh, Brandon Brandon Marsh isn't there anymore. I'm trying to think of their their outfielder that always has a good month of April and then slides off. So they they've won, they've been hot, and the Tigers need to win games, and this is a huge week for the Tigers too, because. I think they're going to be sellers. Everything around the league is everyone saying they're going to be sellers for some weird reason. They keep a lot of people keep saying a lot of a lot of quote unquote experts keep saying that they're going to look to trade Alex Foley or Jason Foley, Alex Lang, Jose Cisnero. I could see a couple of those guys getting dealt. Not so much Jason Foley or Alex Lang. And it doesn't make sense that people keep saying that the Tigers are going to look to trade those guys. When Jose Cisnero, he's gonna he's on an expiring contract, and they have guys in, in Toledo that could take a spot like Matt Whistler. That makes sense, fine. But when you have so many years of team control left of Alex Lang and especially Jason Foley, it was different last year when they traded Soto because they had Alex Lang and Jason Foley sitting in the wings. And it'd be different if you traded Jose Cisnero because he's on an expiring contract. But you can't go, unless unless you're like absolutely blown away, you can't go and 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 deal one of those two guys who are your absolute hold downs at the back end of your, of your bullpen when they have all those years of team control left. It just doesn't make sense. It makes sense when you have guys on expiring contracts or a guy that's a year and a half away. Fine, great. But when you got guys with multiple years... You eventually want to compete. I mean, technically, you could compete this year because your division is so dog shit. But you eventually want to compete. And last time I can recall that the Tigers, when they in the playoff, their weakest link was their bullpen. You know, Jabba Chamberlain and uh, Phil Coke and all them guys got them right out of the... Uh, and Joe Nathan and Erod, all those guys got them right out of the playoffs real fast. You know, because David Dombrowski couldn't build a pen. 
You know, if you got the back end of your bullpen down in a game now where starters don't go seven anymore, it's five and fly, I don't know how many more times you want to sit there and dip into the, to the old piggy bank and, and spend a couple of bucks out of there and make it a little bit lighter in the back end of the bullpen by getting rid of everyone. Eventually, you want to do hold a little bit. You know, relievers are volatile, and it's a very year-to-year kind of thing. And you do have depth. You're dealing with position of depth. But you can't go and just give away, you know, three arms, two arms out of the back end of your pen because you are trying to win. You know, it would be nice for next year that they're an above 500 team, even if they don't make the playoffs, even if they win 84 games, 83 games. I mean, there is a time where you got to go, what the fuck? We need to have something. We need to show that we are trying to progress. We are trying to move forward. I understand that trading those guys can bring you back nice pieces. But at the same time, you know, it is Scott Harris trading it, but at the same time, the Tigers have made a lot of trades over the last few years, and you know they haven't warranted much of returns. Scott Harris has done a better job of one year, whether it was Andy Abanez and Zach McKinstry, you know Tyler Holton, Jason Shreve. He's done a better job getting these guys on one year uh, over the last year than Al Avila did in the past seven. Where like last year he trades Michael Fulmer right before the deadline ends for Sawyer Long Gibson guy. I can't even remember how to say his name because it was so unimportant. But for guys like that, or they trade JD for uh, Sergio Alcantara, uh, Alcantara, Alcantara, God damn, I can't talk, and Dawa Lugo. So it's like, it just, I understand it this year, but there's, with the playoff formats and not being so many sellers versus how many buyers there is, and everyone always could use bullpen depth. I understand that why they people would say they're available and why. You know that you would move them in theory, but at, at at some point in time, you need to keep some kind of talent on the roster because you are trying to build. You aren't going to be a, a farm system for teams to poach off of forever. You do want to be good again. So I have I have no problem getting rid of Jose Cisnero, but I wish people would keep quit saying that they're going to trade Lang and Foley because they're not. They just have too many years of team control left, and they're still too valuable for the for the Tigers to go and deal them. It's like there's rumors saying that they're going to trade Matt Manning or Kerry Carpenter. It's like it's a bunch of bullshit. They're not going to trade them. There was rumors last year they were going to look to trade Derek Skubal, and they did it. It's just so many, like, they, they look at the, what teams are bad, and they go, well, this player's good, and this player's good. They could trade him. At some point in time, you got to fucking keep somebody to, so you can win because – there's no point of being a revolving farm system for the rest of the team to poach your best talent. Kerry Carpenter's not going anywhere. Lang's not going anywhere. Foley's not going anywhere. Jose Snarrow, fine. Erod, that makes sense because he's going to opt out because how good he's been. He's only making less than $50 million for the rest of his contract, even if he opts in. You know, that makes sense to deal him because he's going to want a pay increase. And for the contract he's on now, if he were to opt in versus how he's pitched right now, I'd have no problem with that. If, if, if he goes, listen... I'm going to honor my contract and I'm going to go do whatever because realistically that he could pitch one more year. And and if he sucks next year, the Tigers could honestly eat that contract because he's not owed that much money. It's a team friendly deal. And Lorenzen makes a million percent sense. He's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. And he was your all-star. His value has never been higher in his entire career. You better fucking trade him. Same with Erod. You better trade him. Because you know something, you're getting Casey Mize back maybe by the end of the year. A.J. Hinch today said that he's close to throwing bullpens. You might be getting him back by the end of the year. You got some depth now with, with Fiedo and, and Wentz, even though it's not – I can't stress this enough. The quality isn't amazing, but you do have some depth there. And Reese Olsen has really showed out. Like, he could be a good starter in this league so far. So it's like – What's the point of keeping them? Like, those are pieces that you can trade. Those are pieces that make sense to trade. But, like, Carpenter, Lang, Foley, no. None of those pieces make sense to trade unless you're absolutely blown away. And there was an article talking about how the Diamondbacks could be potentially interested in Erod for Alec Thomas. Now, that makes sense. You know, you get someone that's a better center fielder than Riley Green, you can push Riley Green to the corner. But... My brother and I were talking about this. Thing. Then you look at you got like a log jam of, of left-handed hitting outfielders, and then now you got to kind of figure out, you know, who you want to deal from because you can't have five guys on your roster that are all left-handed hitting outfielders, and you still got guys like you know Justin Henry Malloy that you don't think is going to be an everyday third baseman, so you're trying to get him outfield time. So you eventually he's going to have to have a spot to play to get an opportunity. And Colt Keith, you know, they're playing him uh, at third and second, and he's going to need a spot to play. 
Um, if they even, I don't know if they've tried him in the outfield yet, but they might. Who knows? It seems to be their go-to thing when they're trying to get guys through the system. But there's only so many spots for so many guys, so you can only get so many left-handed hitting outfielders where you got to get you know some right-handedness as well. And it's like, is Badu a long-term thing for this for this team? You know, he has has hit better and he has played better, but is he a long-term viable option for this team? I don't know. I mean, he's been kind of streaking, kind of flukish. I've, I've talked shit about him before in the past, and he has played better this year, and his speed's great, and his defense has been good. But if they were to get, trade him, would I be sad? No. I think there's better left-handed hitting options in the system and on the team currently right now. You know, I, is Nick Maton going to be on this team long term? I don't know. You know, he's been very up and down and he, his results haven't been that great. If some team were to come and offer you something for Matt Veerling to where you could get a, a, a different outfield piece, maybe open up a spot in the outfield uh, for a better potential piece, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to that. You know, I don't think Matt Veerling, I think Matt Veerling has been good, but is he like someone that you're going to build your team around? Probably not. You know, he's more of like a, a fourth outfield depth spot and i don't know just looking at how the team is constructed and looking at like some of what potential trades would be i think they they have more needs at catcher for sure because jake rogers can't consistently hit and eric Haas is absolutely lost he's looking like a non-tender candidate you need something at second something a little more permanent because uh abanez and mckinstry playing the infield you know Giving those guys a lot of ABs have already showed their flaws, even though Aponius has been good and McKinstry's had his moments, but he's been nothing like he was in the month of May. And I think those kind of, those are the kind of guys that you got to limit their at-bats and limit where you play them and, and limit their opportunities for certain handedness so they're going to get exposed. So, you know, they could be pieces that you potentially move and I wouldn't really care about because they're reclamation projects. And for the most part, you've rec- you've completed it. They've proven to be players that can contribute in certain roles on, an, on a major league roster. And, you know, they're towards their late 20s, early 30s. So if you could get something for them, like I wouldn't be opposed to that due to the depth that you have in your system for certain positional players. So I don't know. It's just, it's just I don't know how much is going to go on. Because with this with this deadline and the, the, the teams that are trying to buy and versus the limited number of sellers... I mean, maybe they will go out and sell someone that we don't expect more so than just Ewer Iden and Lorenzen. And, you know, the, their asking price to be good. It'll be high, and maybe they might actually get it. I don't think it's going to be a settled job like last year, like Avila did, where I think Avila was, had his, his ask way too high, and teams showed that they weren't going to pay what he wanted to wanted for those guys. And he got nothing, essentially nothing in return and made very limited trades. I think this year, too, the Tigers are, are trading from a little bit more of quality depth versus last year where it was like, yeah, it's Michael Fulmer, but he's just a reliever who was good, but, you know, he's not, like, that great. He's not nearly as good as Jose Cisnero has been this year. So, and then you look at, you know, teams always need starting pitching, and starting pitching always brings a high premium. So you look at they got two starters they're going to potentially deal. So that'll be, a, a you know, a, a potential nice haul between those two and whatnot. So I don't know. But reading his articles like Kerry Carpenter and Lang and Foley, I don't believe it for a second. But with how the deadline's shaping up and the limited amount of sellers, we'll have to see. But I fully expect them to trade Lorenzen, Cisnero for sure, and potentially Erod. But the other ones, I don't, I don't see a chance in hell. So, but we'll talk more about that when the trade deadline comes. Uh, next week i'll come on here and make a video after it's all done and settled and we'll talk about uh or if a trade happens this week i'll come on and talk about it when it's when it's done and completed and we'll look back on it so i don't know who's gonna go i mean like i said they they're they have a lot of players i mean would some team even want mckinstry or banez i don't know but could harris surprise us sure i mean nothing surprises me with that guy now after some of the moves that he's made and, and some of the players that he's picked up that have been able to contribute on the roster like they have you know that we, we that no one thought you know like exactly kinstrip is going to play on your team and he was going to be actually okay contributor you know no one would have thought abanez was going to be a guy that you'd be like yep that guy's been good for me you know at, at the start of the year so who knows you know got to have faith in scott harris so far, he's he's done nothing uh, to waver the trust, 
And uh, we'll see where it goes the rest of the week. If any trades happen, any news happen, I'll be back, guys. I won't miss a video this week, I promise. I will get my dumb ass here on time. And uh, we'll talk about what went on for this past week and if any trades happen. So I got for you guys today. I greatly appreciate you watching. I greatly appreciate everyone who comments and subscribes. And uh, I'll be back. Have a good one, guys. Go Tigers.